Greetings, comrades, and welcome back to our eighth episode of Chatter in the Skull. And wouldn't you know it, just before I get started, I take a drink of water and I manage to spill it on my shirt, or spill a drop on my shirt, and now all that I can do is stare at this water stain, and I'm sure that is all that you guys are going to be able to do now as well. Hopefully it will dry as the show continues. In any case, I've got a jam-packed show for you guys today. We're going to talk about the World Cup, we're going to talk about the Club Q shooting, and we're going to continue more rather our series on verbal judo. I'm thinking that's going to be a three-part series, so today will be the middle segment and hopefully the most important segment for online discourse. So I'm actually going to talk about some normie shit today. I'm not exactly a soccer guy, but obviously this is the biggest event in the world, the most watched event in the world, and it has bled over into the realm of politics and news and current events, and it gives me a great chance to shine a spotlight on a country which is honestly not very great, to put it mildly. That is, of course, the country of Qatar. And when I say something like not a great country, I am specifically talking about the government, the governmental institutions, and obviously the way the country is run in a political manner, not the individual people of Qatar themselves. Qatar is a country in the Persian Gulf. It is a small peninsula which juts out from the Saudi Arabian part of the coastline. And this little peninsula has for its entire history had a very small population, very limited in terms of resources and trade that it can offer. However, let's just zoom out here. You can see in the Persian Gulf, they have a pretty good position. Their position here on the Persian Gulf does at least allow them to leverage their ability to control trade a bit here. It's obviously not the, the best position in the Persian Gulf, best position right here is obviously controlling the Strait of Hormuz. That being said, Qatar has probably the second best position in the Persian Gulf. And through history, they've used that position to leverage themselves in terms of becoming a naval, a minor naval and, and trading power. That was, of course, pre the discovery of oil and liquid natural gas. And the discovery of this extremely valuable commodity basically injected a syringe of steroids into the Qatari economy to the point where they got much more bulked up than their mass can reasonably hold on to. And when it comes to this very valuable resource, one of the things that makes Qatar so special is the fact that they have some of the quote, smoothest oil, smoothest crude in the world. Essentially, it requires very little refinement, doesn't require as much investment in terms of infrastructure as some other places. So this has been obviously a huge boon to them. Like zooming in here to Qatar, we could see that <laughs> most of this peninsula is just a desert. There's really nothing here. We have small little pockets of farms or small little areas of arable land. He wants this, this guy a farm. Yeah, he's got some sort of farm here. So you've got like tiny little farms that dot the coastline, but obviously most of this land is completely unusable and mostly uninhabited. The vast majority of Qatari residents live here in Doha, which is the capital. And the Qataris are desperate to turn this city into a, another Dubai. And they definitely have the money to do that because one of the interesting things about Qatar is that while the population of the country itself is around 3 million, the actual number of Qataris themselves is extremely small. It's in the neighborhood of 350,000, making them a substantial minority in their own country. But that's okay, because all the money that is made through the sale of oil and liquid natural gas and all these other resources essentially means that you don't have to pay any taxes. Essentially, because you're such a small population that has access to such a large pool of wealth, it means that basically you have access to tons and tons of advantages. Being a Qatari citizen is a pretty sweet deal, even if there aren't very many of them. So that, of course, begs the question, 
where are these other people coming from? If you guys have been paying attention to the news and current events for the last half a decade, let's say, maybe more than that, maybe more than half a decade, you'll know that one of the things brewing under the surface of Qatar has been their misuse of migrant labor and how they have essentially completely abused this migrant labor, turned it into slave labor, essentially, or a very close version of slave labor, and used it to basically build this mega metropolis for the Qatari citizens. Let's look at the demographics of Qatar, and we can see pretty clearly that Qataris are not on top of the pile here in terms of numbers. Indians make up 25% of the population, followed by Bangladeshi and Nepalese. So basically that entire area of Southeast Asia has been heavily recruited from to make up the bulk of the migrant labor which Qatar uses to fund its insane mega projects. And here's the thing, all these people from India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Egypt, the Philippines, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Sudan, Syria, and everywhere else, they don't get to share in the spoils of that oil wealth. It is only the Qatari citizens that get to share in the spoils of that oil wealth. These people come to Qatar you basically promised, essentially, uh, this century's version of a gold rush almost, that they come to Qatar, they can work and make a bunch of money working on these various projects because Qatar is so rich and they have so few citizens that, yes, I can come here, make some money, go back home, and actually support my family or send the money that I'm making here back home to my family, which is something that happens a lot for people who come to, for example, places here, in North America or Western Europe, a lot of the times people from India or Pakistan or what have you, they'll come alone and then they'll work and work and take the extra money and send it back home to their families in India or Bangladesh or, or wherever they happen to be. So this is essentially the plan for these people going to Qatar, but when they get there, it doesn't exactly turn out as well as they were hoping it would. You'd think that these people would have, <laughs> the Qatari people have a lot more to share given the geographical lottery that they won, but as I said, if you've been paying attention to the news, you will know that Qatar has notoriously treated these people like total garbage. That this is an ongoing issue for the Qatari state. More and more, it is becoming the one thing that people associate Qatar with is essentially migrant labor abuse. So we can see here some of the elaborate projects which have been built by some of these migrant workers. Doha itself is a wash in some of these buildings which have some very interesting looking architecture, to say the least. When you look through the city, it does look like a very nice place. It looks like there's lots of cool buildings and parks and resorts and that kind of stuff. But it all takes a very dark and sinister undertone when you realize that all of this was built on the backs of what is essentially slave labor. Which, of course, brings us to their ultimate vanity project, the Altamama Stadium, which is where the 2022 World Cup is currently being held. And as you can see, this is quite a large stadium, quite a huge project indeed. And this is essentially built for the sole purpose of hosting the World Cup. So you might be asking yourself, why would FIFA choose to hold the World Cup in a country that has this track record of human rights abuses, that has basically a very small population, especially in terms of a lot of these other countries which wanted to hold the World Cup, and doesn't exactly have a long history of soccer practice in the country? The answer is, of course, the Qatari government handed them a whole wad of cash and they said, thank you very much. We're going to have the World Cup in your country. Also, oh, don't you dare, don't you dare question our motivations here. Don't you dare think that we are doing anything but the purest and most selfless act by having the World Cup in Qatar. And we haven't even gotten into some of the social issues in Qatar. Obviously, a heavily Islamic country very anti-LGBTQ, and if you mention that you are pro-LGBTQ, you can essentially be arrested and charged by the government. 
Let's see what the FIFA president and human sperm impersonator had to say when questioned about some of these criticisms in regards to Qatar and the World Cup being held in the country. Today, I have very strong feelings. I can tell you that. Me too, bud. Today, I feel Qatari. Today, I feel Arab. Today, I feel African. Today, I feel gay. Today, I feel disabled. Today, I feel a migrant worker. I'm European. Actually, I am European. Not just I feel European. I think for what we Europeans have been doing in the last 3,000 years around the world, we should be apologizing for the next 3,000 years before starting to give moral lessons to people. And the situation of hundreds of thousands of women and men from developing countries who would like to offer their services abroad in order to help and give a future to their families back home. Qatar is actually offering them this opportunity. It's not, and we're going to be looking Hundreds of that. thousands of workers from development countries come here. They earn 10 times more than what they earn in their home country and, and they help their families to survive. End up in serious debt or nothing at all. And they do it in a legal way. We in Europe, we close our borders and we don't allow practically any worker from these countries who earn, who have obviously very low income to work legally in our countries, because we all know there are many illegal workers in our European countries. Let me first assure you that every decision that is taken in this World Cup is a joint decision between Qatar and FIFA. Every decision discussed, debated and taken jointly. You can say nothing that would put me less at ease than that, honestly speaking. There will be, I don't know how many fan zones, eight, ten big fan zones, over 200 places where you can buy alcohol in Qatar anyway. Uh, <laughs> over 10 fan zones where over 100,000 people can simultaneously drink alcohol. 100,000 people at any particular moment. I think personally, if for three hours a day you cannot drink a beer, you will survive, especially because actually the same rules apply in France or in Spain or in Portugal or in Scotland, where no beer is allowed in stadiums. Now here it seems to become a big thing because it's a Muslim country or I don't know why, I, I don't know why. We tried and that's why, that's the one I give you, of course, the late change of policy, because we tried until the end to see whether it was possible. So I actually did some fact-checking on this guy, and it's definitely more complicated than it would first appear. There are some countries which have banned alcohol in stadiums. I don't need this anymore. Ban alcohol in stadiums completely. For example, France is one. Spain is another one. England has some super weird rules, like you are allowed to buy alcohol at the stadium, but you can't drink it in the stands, so you can go to the concession and get a beer and drink it there and then come back to the stands. And then, of course, there are some countries which are completely beer-friendly, Germany being one of them, Belgium being one of them, although apparently, according to this article here, Belgium had a 10-year prohibition on the consumption of alcohol in the stands until they recently reversed it. Italy, another one where you can drink beer in the stands. So it's not exactly a hard and fast rule everywhere. It differs depending on the area that you go to, in any case, I just want to clarify that a little bit, but there's a ton of what this guy had to say that it bothers me to an extreme degree. But let's start with the beer thing, because that's what we're on right now, and then we'll get into the weird colonialism shit. So, in any case, when it comes to beer, yes, as we discovered, there are different rules depending on which country you go to in Europe, but the majority of them seem to allow, yes, you can drink a beer in the stands. So it's certainly reasonable to expect fans to be upset at that fact when they're coming from other countries. But it's not just that. The main thing that people are really upset about is that essentially they announced that 
yes, you can drink alcohol. It's going to be fine. Things are going to be okay. And then just two days before the World Cup starts, nah, sorry guys, just no alcohol, getting rid of that. And that, to me, is the really greasy move. If you go to France, and France has a long-standing policy of no drinking in the stands, you understand that when you're going there, and everything is clear. But people bought tickets to go see this event with expectation that, yeah, you're going to be able to get a beer. It's probably going to cost you $25, but yes, you're still going to be able to get a beer. And then they get there and they realize, oh, wait, we're reneging on that whole deal. We're shutting it down. And of course, there are religious considerations here. Alcohol consumption is very prohibited in Islamic culture. But my feeling here is that, let's say I'm bringing over a Muslim friend for dinner, right? I'm inviting them over to my house. And I say, I respect the fact you can't eat pork. We're going to cook you a pork-free meal. Everything's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. And then two, and he gets there. I'm like, listen, you're having pork chops. Yeah, I know I told you that we were going to give you a pork-free meal. But if you can't eat this dinner, you'll survive. You hopefully brought your own food, right? You brought your own food. That would be super greasy. If someone is going to come over to my house that has, that's a vegetarian or has a gluten allergy, I'm going to prepare a meal and prepare things for them that is respective of that fact. So I feel that essentially what Qatar is doing is inviting the entire world over to come and see their great house. They're inviting the entire world to come over and see. And if you're going to be inviting the entire world that has all these different customs, practices, outlooks on the world, you need to be accommodating of that fact. If you want to show yourself off as a modern cosmopolitan country, then you can't expect everybody to come and play by your rules. If you want to be a good host, you have to make concessions for the people that are coming to visit you. Or at the very least, if you're going to invite people over, make it clear that they're going to have to play by your rules so they can make an informed decision of whether or not they would actually like to come or not. Because if you're going to tell them, hey, listen, everything's cool, and then when they get there, listen, the ball game's completely changed, Obviously, that's going to upset some people. But the one thing I really want to address is his ridiculous comment about colonialism. It's very clear what about ism. And this kind of talk frustrates me so much because what he's talking about absolutely has a kernel of truth to it. But to come out and use that to deflect against legitimate criticism against an authoritarian theocratic government is just so infuriating. So the core of truth is that, yes, obviously, a lot of countries in Europe have pretty sketchy pasts when it comes to colonial practices, to put it mildly. United Kingdom, France, Spain, Portugal, to a lesser extent, countries like Italy, Germany definitely got some things in their past that, that are a little bit dark. But what pisses me off is that this is so hypocritical because you're doing the exact same thing that you don't want people to do, which is essentially paint with a broad brush. That Yes, we just talked about that some countries definitely have colonial pasts that they have to contend with. But you're going to tell a Polish person they got to contend with their colonial past? A country that has basically been treated like a carcass to be divided by greater powers for the last 500 years? Are you going to tell the people of the Czech Republic that they have to atone for their colonial past when they've never held a colony in their entire lives. You tell the people of Albania that they need to contend with their colonial past. Those Moldovans, man, they did some fucked up shit. But the ultimate thing here that really bothers me is this insinuation that because European countries did bad things in the past, essentially that nullifies the bad things that Qatar is doing currently. Just because bad things happened in the past doesn't mean we can't talk about and call out bad things happening in the present. So what are some of the bad things going on? And of course, we do need to say that what we're talking about is absolutely in no way an indictment of Islam or Muslim people. 
everything that we're talking about boils down to authoritarianism. That is the issue, is not the religion itself. That was another thing that really bothered me about our human sperm friends' comments, that essentially trying to say that any criticism of the way Qatar, Qatar is conducting this operation is essentially a criticism of Islam and Muslims as a whole. Total nonsense. Don't buy that bullshit. Continue to call out bad actors for bad actions when you see them. So what are the bad things exactly? Let's get into it. This article is over a year old. This is from February 21st of 2021. And this is the one that is really made the rounds. This is this is from The Guardian, one of the most famous articles. You guys may have read this one already, but this essentially talks about the 6,500 migrant workers which have died since the World Cup was awarded. And this doesn't take the, in the article, I believe it says that it doesn't take into account 2020 data. So now we may be pushing 10,000, 10,000 deaths on this project. And that is utterly appalling. So what exactly happens when you go to Qatar for looking for a better future, as the FIFA president said? What happens is that you go there, and if we go through this article, you are likely to run into issues like this. Gal Singh Rai from Nepal paid nearly £1,000 in recruitment fees for his job as a cleaner in a camp for workers building the Education City World Cup Stadium. Within a week of arriving, he killed himself. So essentially, this guy's got to work up 1,000 pounds in Nepal, which is not an easy amount of cash to work up for a citizen living in Nepal. So he's got to cough up this money just to hope to get a chance of getting a job in Qatar. So he's got to pay them, right? The people who've got all the oil money, he, they have to pay them to get a job, goes there, realizes it's shit, he's not making enough money, and he fucking blows his brains out. One of the things they used to do for these people when they would arrive, and they say that they've stopped, but <laughs> yeah, I don't believe that for a fucking second. One of the things that they would do, essentially, is confiscate these people's passports. So now you can't leave. You've spent this money to go to a country that you don't know the customs, you don't know what you're in for, you're hoping to get a better life for you and your family. You get there, they take your passport, you have horrific living conditions, and apparently all of your buddies are just going to mysteriously die of natural deaths, which, as we can see here, is often attributed to acute heart or respiratory failure. So these people are just keeling over for no reason at all, seemingly. Of course, there's a reason, but it's not like these... They're obviously covering it up. Well, something tells me that these people just aren't mysteriously falling over of heart attacks. It's not like somebody's got like a death note and he's like writing down these migrant workers' names or some shit. And now this brings me to Al Jazeera. So why are we going to Al Jazeera? In case you guys don't know, Al Jazeera is actually the news agency owned and operated by the Qatari government. And here's the thing about Al Jazeera is that they actually do good reporting with a major caveat. And that is that they do great reporting outside of the Middle East. When it comes to their reporting on the Middle East, their perspective is 100% bias. And this is one of the things I want to tell you guys when you guys are trying to read the news yourselves trying to parse things out on your own accord. It's important to know what a news source is good at and where they're weak. And with Al Jazeera, yeah, you can take a lot of the reporting in things outside of the Middle East for face value. In fact, they probably have some of the best reporting on world affairs out there. However, when it comes to talking about things in their own backyard, yeah, don't trust them in any way, shape, or form to do that. Let us do something here. Let's pull up Qatar Migrant. Whoops. And let's Google that, or not Google that, search that, and let's see what we can see here. Okay. How wage abuse is hurting Qatar's migrant worker. Okay, that actually might seem like a negative article. Two days ago, industrial area rocking with 
fan fervor, music, and food, migrant laborers say a ticket quota would have been welcome. Okay, so this seems like an article where everything's going fine, everything's a okay, there's my, my, nothing wrong with those migrant workers. A renewed calls for Qatar to address treatment of migrant workers. Ooh, let's look at these pictures. I bet that they're all going to be great. And I like this one too. FIFA powerless over Qatar labor rights. Let's look, let's do a brief parse on some of these and see exactly what they are saying here. So this one's actually pretty good in terms of that's actually got some real negative ends up on what's happening. So now Angeline is struggling and surviving and waiting for her end of the contract so she can go home. We've not been paid since April 1st. And we've been working since then due to the coronavirus pandemic. Of course, this is during the height of the pandemic. She told Al Jazeera and the reporters gave her staff a one-time allowance of $55 in April. Angeline says her employers have refused to support her staff financially and have even confiscated passports and ATM cards. Wow, okay, this is actually definitely talking about some serious issues. My last salary is paid in March, and since then the company has not given us anything, not a single real. We are only able to survive through private donations of rice and food. Workers have also told Al Jazeera that some employers transfer their salaries into workers' bank accounts, but force employees to hand over the ATM cards before withdrawing the amount. The Qatari government said it encourages workers to lodge their complaints with the labor ministry. Okay, I will admit, this one it was a pretty reasonably good article covering this situation. When was this? This is from August 2020. Here's this one from a couple days ago. Okay, we played a big role. The anticipation was palpable, which was set up in a neighborhood where most of Qatari's labor population lives. I'm here in the middle of it and naturally thrilled. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. So they cut out some of his statements. That 45-year-old Mohammed Hussein from Bangladesh. So yeah, this is one. This is definitely the opposite. This is a fluff piece. This is one was from two days ago. Everything's going fine here in the World Cup. I'm happy. Okay, wow. So they have, most of this is about the opening. They have one little segment about the migrant workers in this opening here. And it's one guy saying that I'm happy to be here. I'm thrilled. Being part of the World Cup is a big deal personally because it was the first time the Muslim company hosted the tournament. Although his home country is one of the world's greatest cricket playing nations, Hussein said does not expect Bangladesh to replicate similar success in international football. My country has had no chance in my lifetime to qualify the World Cup or host it. Okay, yeah, he's saying that he's happy to be there. Qatar did not have a metro or buses on the roads. All these buildings, all these highways may not exist if this giant event was not taking place, said Peter, a worker from India. He told Al Jazeera, I'm happy to say that we migrant workers played a big role, he said the 46-year-old that came to Qatar more than 15 years ago in a fiber optic making company. So yeah, they've got these fluff pieces Everything's going well. Migrant workers are fine. They're happy. They're good. And this is the one which will come up most recently because it's from two days ago. Of course, they're all doing great. They're happy to be part of the World Cup. No issues. Next one. This one's from three years ago. Renewed calls for Qatar to address treatment of migrant workers. Doha vows to comprehensively address labor issues after report says hundreds of workers returned home penniless. So let's see what this one has to say. This is from a response to an Amnesty International report, which came out in March 2017, showing that Qatar was seriously abusing its migrant labor. And then <laughs> in a statement to Al Jazeera in the wake of the Amnesty International report, Qatar's government communications office said, Qatar has made substantial progress in labor reforms when it comes to work with NGOs, including international labor organization, to ensure that these reforms are far-reaching and effective. Total nonsense. Any issues or delays with our systems will be addressed comprehensively. We have said from the outset that this would take time, resources, and commitment. Of course, yes. Man, the community received 6,000 complaints last year. So this one's actually not bad. Uh, it's a fluff piece because they're just taking the, the Qatari government at their word. But at the same time, they do... Put, publish at least some of the complaints and uh, they say that here <laughs> the investigations confirmed the salaries have been delayed following a period of negative cash flow of both companies paused by non-payments elsewhere in the supply chain of course it's all somebody else's fault okay just a few more here i spent too long <laughs> getting absorbed in this stuff but here's our pictures right as you can see mostly just fluff pieces guys just doing their thing looking like they're in business, doing important stuff, doing a-okay. 
And then I just got a couple more. We'll just go through the headlines here. We have this one from 2017. UN clears Qatar over uh, treatment of migrant workers. Definitely had to have that one up there. And then we have Qatar rejects report on unexplained labor deaths. So what, what I like what they said here is pretty funny. Here we go. Qatar's government communication office spokespersons in a statement said that they do not agree or support the position Amnesty International has taken against Qatar. It's basically saying that they, all these people are dying unnecessarily and for unexplained reasons. The positive impact of labor reforms in Qatar is quite clear for all to see. Hooray! The reforms have benefited over 1 million people to date. The reality is that no other country has come so far in such a short amount of time. Yeah. Unfortunately, Al Jazeera, good for some things, but definitely not good when it comes to covering the issues that their own government is causing. And one of the things I want you guys to just notice here is like when we look this up, we can see that these articles write 2020, two days ago, 2019, 2020, 2014, 2013, 2021, 2017, 2022, 2021. They release like two or three maybe articles per year on this. Per year, they're just covering it once or twice. Coming back, usually just to say that everything's fine and there's nothing going on. So again, just want you guys to be aware that while some news sources are good at some things, they are not good at other things. And you guys need to be mindful of that. One thing I love here before we wrap up this segment is just to really illustrate how this is such a bought and paid for scam is that this is Qatar's first, first entry into the World Cup. Their first appearance is in 2022, happens to be the first time that they're hosting the event in and of itself. And okay, maybe, maybe they're good. Maybe they're better than we think. Okay, so let's check how they're doing in their first games. No, oh, yeah, they, they got destroyed in their first match. 2 nothing. Pretty convincing defeat. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see how things go on from there. But I'm not exactly enthusiastic about the Qatari football team's chances at taking home the World Cup. Anyway, let's change gears here a little bit and move to the United States. I guess this is the episode of the Qs, because now we're talking about the daily shooting at Club Q, which unfolded a couple days ago. And this is just another unfortunate tragedy that is plaguing the United States. Right now, what it seems like is that this happened. It, wants to, it happened in Colorado, where individual basically went to a LGBTQ nightclub and essentially opened fire ended up killing six people before he was eventually brought down by an army veteran who basically denied all of his basic instincts for self-preservation and ran into the club while everyone was running out and was able to essentially wrestle this shooter to the ground and proceeded to pistol whip him with his own pistol. And I don't want to spend too much time dwelling on this particular tragedy it is unfortunately another one in a long list of tragedies that, like I said, have just been plaguing the United States in the last two or three decades. Before I move on to what I really want to talk about, I do want to talk a little bit about the what we know about the shooter. We do know that apparently this guy was a fairly disturbed individual and had been on police radar before. He had made videos essentially challenging the police to breach his home, come and attack him. He's made bomb threats like this guy has been on the radar for a long time for law enforcement and has clearly been a person who is mentally disturbed. And while we don't know the motivation quite yet, I'm not going to go out and say that this is 100% a hate crime when we don't know if it is. But if I were to make an assumption, yeah, I would assume that this is probably a motivated crime against LGBTQ individuals. And we can really see this with how the right has responded to this tragedy. And it has been disgusting, to say the least, and infuriating. And this is what I really want to talk about here. So let's look at how some of the right responded to this horrific tragedy. This is a great little screenshot posted by the Surf Times. He says that Tim Pool and Steven Crowder are just openly justifying the murder of LGBTQ plus people in public. These are two of the biggest political channels on YouTube. 
And the original quote here is Tim Pool saying we shouldn't tolerate pedophiles grooming our kids. Club Q had a grooming event. All right there, Timmy. Where's your source on that one? Steven Crowder responds by saying strong legislation to protect children and an armed populace needed to protect themselves slash their kin. This little tweet really exemplifies what drives me up the wall about Tim Pool. Steven Crowder, this guy's a well-known charlatan, makes up his stuff all the time, makes up interviews with people that are on his own side and he pretends that they're left-wing people. I don't really listen to what he says very much. He's not on my roster because I don't feel like he provides anything valuable, serious, or meaningful to the conversation in any way. Tim Pool, on the other hand, is on my roster, and I do think that he has more of a cultural sway. And the reason he is because a lot of people, and I think less and less, thankfully, have bought into this idea and notion that somehow Tim Pool is this quote-unquote milk toast fence sitter. He is not that in any way, shape, or form. Accusing LGBTQ plus club of having a grooming event. And then, of course, saying that we shouldn't tolerate pedophiles grooming kids. Obviously implying that's what's happening. Yes, he didn't explicitly say that's what's happening. It's obviously heavily implied in the statement here. This is something that no milk toast fence sitter would ever say in a million years. To accuse someone of being something so terrible as being a pedophile upon the flimsiest of evidence is about the most incendiary and quite frankly extreme thing that you can do in the political arena right now. In a time when we are living in a very incendiary political climate. This kind of language and this kind of rhetoric has heated up the political climate to the point where these kind of events are happening and you have people basically saying that somebody had to do something, they're going too far, oh, we gotta make something up. And these are the emotional buttons that they push in people to get them to go out and do these extreme acts of political violence. To call someone a pedophile, them's fighting words as they like to say, and you shouldn't be surprised when somebody picks up a gun and, and decides that they want to fight. And the last thing about this I want to say is it just illustrates that the won't somebody think of the children argument is the supreme argument for conservatives. That this is their cover for anything and everything they want to do. And when they want to ratchet up their rhetoric and they want to ratchet up their actions to the highest degree that they can... That is the card they will play. Won't somebody think of the children? And God damn it, it's disgusting. And as a parent, it pisses me off to no end. Yeah, nobody's coming for my kids. And I certainly don't want these clowns messing up her upbringing with their insane ideology. Clowns like Matt Walsh wonder why no reputable person will review his transphobic propaganda film, What is a Woman? And the reason why... Is very clear. It would be like a 9-11 truther making a movie or a flat earther making a movie which basically expounded all of the virtues of their conspiracy theory and said that everyone who didn't believe it was evil and then went around asking like, why is no one reviewing this movie? Why is no one reviewing this movie? And the reason is nobody wants to give legitimacy to a conspiracy theory. And unlike the conspiracy theories of flat earthers and to a lesser extent 9-11 truthers, this conspiracy theory, which is that LGBTQ plus people are coming for your kids, this one is actually resulting in real world harm and resulting in real world acts of terror. And no sane or moral person wants to have any blood in their hands by giving any legitimacy or credence to such nonsense. Ooh, I just uh, realized I was getting a little heated there. Come back down a little bit because uh, we're going to move back into what we were discussing at the end of the last episode, and that is some of the principles of verbal judo and how these relate into our conversations with people both in person and online. So last episode, we talked about sort of the values of empathic communication 
and how important it is to establish empathic communication, not just when you're trying to persuade somebody or convince them, but in your everyday life. But if your goal is to actually persuade or convince somebody, you need to have some level of empathy for them at some point. But empathy itself is not enough. Essentially, all the empathy is the guide. It's the pathway to get you from point A to point B. And you still have to walk the path. And it isn't always clear exactly what is the best reaction in any given circumstance. So now we're going to delve deeper into these principles. And essentially, when it comes to dealing with people, verbal judo affects the human population into three different categories and three different types of people that you'll have to deal with in your everyday life. These people are nice people, difficult people, and deceptive people. Originally, these people were called just wimps, but it's been kind of expanded as the ideas and concepts of verbal judo have been expanded over time. So what exactly does this mean? Let's start with the nice people. And these are essentially the kind of people that we were talking about last time. Your nice people are your stereotypical nice guys and gals. You're very agreeable people who will always be polite to you. They will, generally speaking, treat you with respect. Even if you don't treat them with respect, they will still treat you back with respect. If you're in a position of authority and you ask them to do something, they'll probably do it. If they're your friend or family and you ask them for your for a favor, they'll probably do it for you. These are the kind of people that are cooperative and generally good to be around. And the most important thing when it comes to dealing with nice people, because nice people are generally easy to deal with. It comes with the territory. But the biggest thing and the most important thing when dealing with them is to make sure that you don't take their niceness for granted and you don't take advantage of their niceness or cooperation. Because while a nice person may not call you out to your face right away or do something right away, if you continue to take advantage of them, that resentment will build and build and build. And eventually it's gonna come out in some way or another. And that's usually a never a pretty thing. With nice people, you treat them with respect. They'll always treat you with respect. And so long as it stays that way, you'll probably have a kind and loyal friend for the foreseeable future. Next are the difficult people. And these are the people that definitely make up the bulk of people online. One of the things I think is interesting is society has evolved in interacting with people both online and in person a lot, is that I would say that in person, the nice people outnumber the difficult people pretty sizably, maybe three, three to one, four to one, that, that kind of uh, ratio. But online, it's the opposite, right? It's difficult people outnumber nice people, like maybe more than three to one, maybe five to one or more. But uh, yeah, it's interesting that in person, more people tend to be nice people, quote unquote. But once we get on the internet, we become much more difficult. So what exactly is a difficult person? They got these like little actions beside them, right? The 10 out of 10 for the nice guy is always going to do what you want 10 out of 10 times. And difficult person, zero out of 10 times, right? These are the people that when you ask them to do something, their immediate response is going to be, why? Why do I have to do it? Why should I do it? These are the kind of stubborn people generally going to dig in and not move. They're going to entrench themselves. When it comes to dealing with difficult people, you need a lot more finesse because just asking them almost certainly results in a total shutdown. And we're going to be talking about difficult people mostly today and how to deal with them because they make up the bulk of our interactions online, particularly when it comes to a adversarial context, but even not so much, right? Like sometimes you'll be on Reddit or something and just post this <laughs> completely neutral comment or completely nothing controversial, whatever. And then there'll be some asshole that comes in and either decides A, they're going to insult you, B, they're going to completely belittle what you said, or C, they're going to completely dismiss you and then go into some kind of weird non sequitur. These are the kind of people that are itching for a fight. And nice people are the opposite. They want to avoid conflict at all costs. Difficult people relish conflict. They love conflict. They look for opportunities to stoke that fire. And for me personally, I would definitely say that I am a difficult person. 
who has, through a lot of trial and error in their life, learned that being a difficult person isn't always the best thing to do, and sometimes you do actually have to give a little bit to get along and be nice to get along. But at my core, my first reaction is to always ask why, to be contrarian, to be that kind of difficult person. And lastly, you have your deceptive people. And these are people that you don't know where they stand. These are people who, they have a broken down wimp or wolf. It used to be that these are just wimps, essentially, but they've added it, added on to a wimp or a wolf. Basically, these are the kind of people that will say something to your face, but then they will do the opposite behind your back. If they're a wimp, these are the people that are kind of like your rats right? That they will tell you that <laughs> they like you or whatever, or that they're not going to tell on you for some bad thing that you did. And then the next day they're right in the boss's office telling them everything that you said. The wolf is different in the sense that, yeah, they might say everything to you, to your face that you want to hear. But as soon as you turn around and as soon as the opportune moment comes, they're going to stab you in the back, that they're going to harbor resentment for whatever issue they might have with you and to your face they might tell you it's all good everything's fine and then bam all of a sudden you got a knife in your ribs so these people are definitely the most difficult to deal with to quote l he would say something like lying monsters are a real nuisance they are much more difficult than other types of monsters and when it comes to these deceptive people they are much more difficult to deal with because you never know where you stand with them. You can't take them at face value. That while at least with a difficult person, yeah, it's going to be difficult to deal with them, but at least you know what you're in for and you know where you stand. And with that kind of firm base, again, you can try and begin to navigate that difficult person over to your point of view. With the deceptive person, it is very difficult. And one thing deceptive people really like is plausible deniability. They like to hide behind other people, hide behind excuses, hide behind what they like to call weasel words, you would say. When it comes to dealing with these people, the best way and the best thing you can do is be direct with them because they don't like directness. They will often try and shy away from directness. They don't necessarily like conflict either, or at least conflict that isn't entirely on their terms. So you basically need to flush them out from their cover if they're in a public setting or if it's in a private setting, you usually need to go toe to toe with them in the sense that you call them out and you say, listen, I know that you said to me that we were all cool, but then I saw you in the boss's office type of, type of thing. What's going on there? Being called out or caught up in their nefarious schemes is definitely the best way to deal with these deceptive people. When I deal with someone who I feel is a deceptive person, I like to always try and make sure that my ass is covered in some way that I am maybe recording the conversation or, you know, that there's a camera or it's a public place or whatever, because you never know what can go down with these kind of people. So with those explained, let's go back to the difficult people and focus on them for a second. And the difficult people, usually they communicate in three ways, right? It's denials, it's questions, and it's insults. And especially when you deal with people online, you deal with pretty much all of these on a regular basis. <laughs> you'll, you'll go over comments that have all three of those. But let's start with questions because when you're dealing with people in person, questions are definitely the number one thing that usually come up. And when it comes to questions, you rarely want to avoid them when you're communicating with somebody because one of the essence of judo and verbal judo is to not resist a person's force, rather to redirect it. And not answering questions is effectively resisting them. So one of the biggest questions you'll hear is why, of course, why anything? And you always have to have a good pithy explanation as to why. I remember one of my bosses once gave me a great piece of advice. He told me, he said, make sure whenever the boss comes around, you always have an answer for him. Doesn't matter if it's a truthful answer. Just make sure you're always giving him an answer type of thing. 
you don't want to be a why, I don't know guy. When somebody asks something, why, I don't know, not really going to get you very far. And when you're coming to a, a political discussion and political debate, usually the why will be around, why should I listen to you? Why should I take you seriously? Why should I believe what you have to say? Especially if you're a socialist or a left-leaning person and I've heard all these awful things about them and I don't want to listen to you type of thing. And when it comes to dealing with those questions and dealing with difficult people in general, one of the first things you always want to do is talk about what's in it for them. And if this is a person that actually wants to have a good faith conversation with me and wants to maybe have something there, one of the things I will say that, that I can give you, you know, that is to your advantage is that at the very least, you don't have to sit and you don't have to agree with everything that I say, but at the very least, let's have a fun conversation. Let's have a stimulating conversation. Let's talk about things that we maybe disagree with and we'll have a good time. I'm not the kind of guy that's going to sit there and yell at you or scream at you. I want to chill. I want to have a beer. I want to have a real conversation and get to the heart of these issues. So yeah, basically that that's my kind of pitch is that, hey, maybe, you know, you don't have to take me seriously. You don't have to believe me. You, you don't have to list everything I say, but maybe at the end of the day, we'll have a good conversation. We'll have a good time. And if they deny that, then at that point, you can go into the realm of this person probably isn't in good faith, doesn't actually want to have a good faith conversation. And in that case, they're probably much more interested in having the kind of uh, what you would call like insulting conversation where they're more interested in maybe humiliating you or trying to get you in like gotcha type of a moment or a gotcha type of question or insulting you and your beliefs in some other way. And this leads into the second way that difficult people will communicate with you, which is insults. And when it comes to insults, the number one most important thing, and I definitely want to stress this with left-leaning people particularly, is to not get emotional when it comes to the insults game. Not to get quote-unquote triggered. Because when conservatives are playing that game, it's not about the debate in any way, shape, or form. It's not about the ideas. It's not about the ideology. It's essentially about trying to say some ridiculous thing so they can elicit an emotional response in you and then basically laugh about it later. They don't care about the debate. They don't care about the ideas. They don't care about persuading you. It's all about that triggered response. And if you deny it to them by not getting emotional, by not getting upset, then either one of two things happens. They either disengage and don't want to talk anymore because they're not getting what they want, or they actually end up respecting you and actually end up appreciating you a little bit more and taking what you have to say more seriously because you're not the kind of person that's just going to get triggered and is going to default to emotional response once you've heard something provocative. So always keep your cool, guys, as much as you possibly can. That is another principle of airbender argumentation is keep your cool. And then when it comes to difficult people, the last type of communication that they're going to have is denial. And that can be the toughest one to break through because at that point, they probably actually aren't interested in a conversation at all. They aren't even interested in triggering you. They're just interested in saying whatever they want to say and just saying it over and over again and then denying anything that you say in opposition. And I would say that the deniers are actually the closest things to lost causes, even more so than the insulters, because it's clear that they're not interested in engaging in any way, shape, or form. So at that point, with the deniers, for me, I switch to, I'm going to try and needle you a little bit. I'm going to try and poke you. I'm going to try and say something. Now I'm going to be the one to try and elicit that emotional response in you and we'll see how things go from there. And that's if you actually are interested in continuing the conversation. If you're not interested in continuing, you can just leave it be because you're not gonna get anywhere. But the absolute last thing you ever want to do with a denier, and, and honestly, this is with most of these people, is just give some long diatribe of like text, just like some wall of text and as someone who is an avid wall of text writer, I have to know when is the time for the wall of text and when is the time for the, the pithy response. And when it comes to dealing with difficult people, it's rarely a time for a wall of text. 
I feel like a lot of the time when people are doing big, long walls of text in arguments online, that is not necessarily in debates or whatever. It's, I don't know if any of you guys watch, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. It's like when a Mac is doing his like sweet karate moves and it's just like going like, <laughs> this to me is that the verbal equivalent of that. This is like somebody trying to so show off their sick karate moves and they just look epically cringe when everything's said and done. Ultimately though, when it comes to dealing with difficult people, and that's both in real life and online, the important things to remember here are to keep your cool. You're dealing with something, and you're dealing with someone that's difficult, so be prepared to take a few of the old verbal slings and arrows. That part is definitely shitty, but honestly, it's something I think people kind of learn to relish over time and relish the opportunity to deal with difficult people because there's something stimulating about conflict, right? There's something stimulating about controversy. And uh, particularly for difficult people, uh, controversy really draws us in. So anyway, sorry, I'm getting uh, sidetracked again. You want to keep your cool. You want to be able to articulate yourself in a clear and concise manner. And most of all, you want to have fun with these people. I have fun with these people, both in real life and online. And uh, if you're having fun, you might actually have a real possibility in bringing somebody over to the way you view the world. One of the, my biggest complaints about how the left has conducted itself maybe in the last five to 10 years is that we've lost this archetype of the happy warrior. There's a reason why Jack Layton remains one of my foremost political idols. And if you don't know Jack Layton, he was a leader of the NDP who brought the NDP to the official opposition here in Canada and then unfortunately died very shortly into his tenure. In any case, one of the reasons why I consider him one of my personal political idols is because he really embodied that happy warrior mentality better than any leftist politician I can think of, at least in my life. We definitely got the warrior part down. There's no question that left-leaning people are eager and willing to go to the table, to go to bat, and fight for what they believe in, but we need to make sure that we look like we're having fun while we're doing it. I think uh, the left comes off, they have a bad stereotype of being stern and fun-sucking and uh, sterile. I don't want that. I don't feel that way at all. I'm always having fun. Almost always, I would say. Not always, but most of the time I'm having fun when I'm talking about this kind of stuff. And it's important to, to try and find that fun and enjoyment when you can. So I wanted to delve deeper into verbal judo, but we're going over i don't like to make these episodes go over the hour mark so much anymore and that's when they become i think daunting for people to view and to watch and to listen to but yeah we're over that right now and i do want to have a feel good story for you guys so we're gonna have to wrap up our segment on verbal judo after finishing it off today i'm getting the feeling that i might have to extend it to four episodes to really cover all of this stuff but in the meantime, I hope I've given you guys some more stuff to think about and uh, some more kind of ideas when it comes to dealing with people who may not always agree with you. All right, let's look at this story here. This is from Atlas. And this is a wave-powered buoy that can vastly reduce the ecological cost of desalinization. And this is our feel-good story for the episode. And this is another sort of realm that I have been following closely is the realm of desalinization, what it actually takes to desalinate water, how efficiently can we do that, what are some of the issues involved, and it is not the most efficient process. Basically, desalinization is difficult because salt bonds with water very easily, and it's not always easy to break that bond. So there are two main ways in which desalinization is done to water. The first being the most obvious that you probably think of when you think of desalinization. That is, of course, heat methods, which is you heat the water and then, of course, it evaporates. The fresh water evaporates up and then you can then separate the fresh water from the salty water and go from there. The main issue with that is it tends to be very energy inefficient to create fresh water that way. So it is not always preferred. The more preferred method that we have now is a reverse osmosis method in which you are actually able to get water and salt to separate through that process. And it's a lot more energy efficient 
and it tends to be what most desalinization plants use to desalinate water, including this little buoy that we're going to look at. But there is one more little wrinkle when it comes to desalinization that can make it a little bit tricky, which is that once you're finished desalinating the water, what do you do with the salty brine left over? And that can typically have very high concentrations of salt to the point where it can be ecologically damaging to the system around it. One of the things that this buoy has done is, is tried to alleviate that issue, whereas other desalinization plants usually just dump that salty water back into the ocean, which usually ends up in the area around the desalinization plant being very hostile for life. So let's read a little bit about what exactly this thing is and why it's so cool. So this came out, this is a pretty recent article, November 21st, 2022. So basically this little device here, it's made from 170,000 recycled plastic bottles and it runs on mechanical power, which is generated from the waves itself. So I went through this little article here before we sat down and talked about it. So basically what it does is it uses the wave power to both suck up and desalinate the water and not only that to transport the fresh water back to the mainland so it's incredibly cool doesn't need any kind of fossil fuels or anything like that so through the power of the waves you basically take this thing you anchor it to the sea floor and it will continue to absorb water through wave powered desalinate it and again it uses a verse osmosis system there we go they operate entirely on wave power anchored to the sea floor anywhere anchored to the sea floor anywhere with an average wave height of more than one meter three feet so that they can absorb energy from the passing waves and convert it into mechanical pumping forces that draw in seawater and push around a quarter of it through a reverse osmosis desalinization system to create fresh drinkable water which is pumped back through land to hot through high density polyethylene pipelines using once again only the power created by the waves now here's the interesting part is that the three quarters of the wave which is used to power this machine three quarters of that wave power gets mixed back into the salty brine which is urged from the desalinization process which only means that it's about 30% saltier than the water around it, which is thankfully a negligible change compared to other more concentrated versions of desalinization. So a pretty cool little machine here that essentially gets around a lot of the issues when it comes to desalinating water. And I think this thing has quite an interesting little future here and I really hope that we can continue to find more and interesting ways to desalinate water because it's water extremely important for us to live. Unfortunately, only about 1% of the world's fresh water is accessible to humans. So if we could start building these little recycled desalinization machines, goodbye water shortages virtually anywhere. Essentially, you just anchor them to the ground, let the waves do their thing, and it will just essentially take care of everything for you with minimal environmental impacts. It's super cool. And I think it just is a great, great thing to look at and a great way to end our episode for the day with a very cool little feel good story. And hopefully we can continue to see desalinization efforts continue to expand throughout the globe. So that brings us to the end of our long and fiery episode this week. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And without further ado, I'm just going to wrap things up because I've said enough this week. Until next time, this has been to Comrade. Signing off for now. You guys take care.